back to Exploring the Lord of the Rings. My name is Corey Olson, the Tolkien Professor, and I am delighted to be back with you again this week. Uh, sorry, I'm a little later than usual. Uh, lots of <laughs> lots of stuff going on. It's been a really busy few weeks here uh, in the Signum University world. Uh, but anyway, we are here now and excited to get back near, <laughs> but not quite on to Weathertop. Um, before I started tonight, one quick announcement, because we've got a deadline that's coming up fairly soon uh, that I wanted to make sure everybody was aware of, and that is our next uh, our next moot, our next regional moot, uh, and that is in Northern California in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, this would be my second trip ever to the San Francisco Bay Area. Can't wait to get back there. Um, and... Um, Anyway, so uh, if you go to the Signum University website, which this is, and you go down just a little bit, these are all of our upcoming events. So you can see, hey, look, there is Middle Moot in uh, Missouri near Kansas City there, uh, which is going to be in the beginning of October. So you can see all the information there. But Bay Moot is the one that is coming up soonest. Uh, so we're going to click on here. So you can see it's going to be at Mills College uh, there in Oakland. And you can, this is the registration link where you can go. It's only 40 bucks a person. Uh, and uh, there's the whole schedule here for the day. So you can see the really fun topics that are being discussed and uh, everything else. So uh, this is uh, uh, lots of awesome information. So I, I, I really uh, look forward to, to seeing folks here. The regional moots have been uh, really awesome. I've just been doing a lot of kind of reviewing of that. We're, we're coming to the end of our fiscal year. So we're doing a lot of sort of reviewing over what happened over the course of this year. Uh, and certainly, you know, as we're planning for the coming year and everything, and certainly our regional moots have been one of the highlights for me uh, of this past year. Uh, I've been so glad to be able to go around the country and to um, uh, and to to meet so many folks. Uh, we had how many did we have? We had three regional moots this right? Three, yeah, three this past. Uh, this past year, uh, we had um, uh, Middle Moot uh, first in Iowa. Then we had the uh, uh, Tex Moot down in Texas in January, and we had London Moot uh, in April. Uh, and all of them were really uh, were really exciting and fun. We already had eight planned for this coming year, and um, we might get a couple in uh, a couple more in in the spring. Um, so the Bay Moot is the beginning of uh, this uh, our our sort of slate of regional moots in this next year where I'm going to be going around the country at a great rate uh, and uh, getting to meet so many more of you. And I just, I, 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 I so appreciate that. JJ's asking when Kiwi moot is. Yeah, we're working on that actually. And if there's anyone uh, in New Zealand who is listening, I don't know if you'd be listening live as it's an inconvenient time of day over there. Well, I mean, I guess it's not that inconvenient, uh, not as inconvenient as it is say in Europe right now. Um, but in any case, Hey, anyone in New Zealand who wants to help us uh, host one, I am ready. I would love to plan one. Because in fact, of course, one of the difficulties, one of the challenges of scheduling these moots is working around the weather. We don't want to uh, schedule uh, a moot in, a, in, in a, a bad location in a you know, questionable winter weather area uh, and stuff. So, you know, the Southern Hemisphere, kind of attractive, actually, right? To do like a nice early December moot, you know, down in New Zealand. I'm feeling it. You know, I think that would be really good. Uh, so, um, so yeah, we'll, we'll see, right? We'll see how that goes. But I, 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 I'm, I'm open. Again, like New Zealanders, talk to me. Let's work on this. Or, or Australia. I'd love to go to Australia. Never been to either place. Would love to go. That would be awesome. Um, uh, so, anyhow... Uh, Marianne asks, any plans for the Pacific Northwest? Tentative ones, actually. Yes, we're working on we're working on Seattle. Uh, that's something. And maybe maybe spring next year. Not quite sure. Um, but um, but anyway, yeah, we're we're uh, we're um, we're definitely thinking that that's not one of our scheduled ones so far. Uh, but it's we're definitely thinking about it. Omali would like to do Florida. Orlando would be would be an excellent location and a good uh, winter weather up here in the Northeast uh, location there as well. So. Um, yeah. Anyhow. Um, yeah, no, so we're definitely, definitely open uh, and open to these anyway. So this is, this is, this has been so much fun. 
But up next, as I say, Northern California, and the registration deadline is coming. Registration is open through the end of July, so there's only a couple weeks left uh, in which to uh, in which to register. So any of you who are around there in the in, in the nor- in, in Northern California, uh, I really hope to be able to see you. I know we've got a lot of uh, a lot of listeners and uh, uh, you know people who've been following the podcast for a long time who are in California. So definitely, uh, I definitely look forward to that. Excellent. I see. Uh, I see a couple of you here who are coming. Veronica here in the Discord chat. Gladys up there in the uh, in the uh, uh, in the Twitch chat. Definitely coming to Bayboot. That is awesome. I, I, I can't wait to uh, can't wait to meet you. So still plenty of spots. Uh, definitely would love to see you at Baymoot if you can make it out for the day. Um, as you can see, it starts at like nine o'clock in the morning and it ends at four o'clock in the afternoon. It's just a one day event. You can just sort of drive in. It's a uh, uh, it should be you know should be relatively easy. Um, and or if you're coming in uh, uh, and gonna you know if, if you're uh, in town or, or, or nearby, um, the day before as well. I'm thinking of doing, um, uh, and I like to do, we've done this at a couple other moots and I, I, I'm thinking of doing this again. I'd love to do a kind of an informal, uh, just kind of hang out and get together and chat, uh, 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 you know, have dinner together the night before the Friday night before, um, still kind of working on that. Zephan, it's interesting you mentioned Cincinnati, as actually uh, we have a couple volunteers who are trying to put together an Ohio moot, actually. That's a, that's a thing, which is definitely in process, actually. So, yeah, we're definitely, definitely thinking about that. Um, so, uh, yeah, awesome. Anyway, so please do, please don't forget and tell your friends, come down to Bay Moot. Bay Moot is next, and then we're going to be continue i'll continue to progress around the country uh and uh we will have more and more of our awesome fun uh uh tolkien and not just tolkien of course these moots are not just tolkien conferences these are you know uh, 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 you know places where people are discussing i mean they're really designed for all of our sort of our broader uh myth guard and signum interests so uh you know people who are interested in medieval literature people who are interested in other fantasy and science fiction uh uh, uh you know stories and uh either film or, or, or books um, are, you know, presenting and, and are welcome to present things like that. So it's, 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 it's sometimes people, because I'm like there, you know, and I'm the Tolkien professor, people get the impression that this is just a Tolkien thing, right? It's not just a Tolkien thing, uh, these events. We do talk a lot of Tolkien there, and obviously I enjoy doing that, but it's not the only focus of these events. Um, so, all right, let's... Um, uh, Yes. Oh, and uh, Evil Doctor Cannon Text Moot is going to happen again. I believe in January. Um, the uh, I was just talking briefly to the organizers who are starting to uh, work on the plans for Text Moot too. So yes, Text Moot definitely happening again. That's uh, still holds the record for our uh, our our largest attendance um, uh, at uh, uh, for, at any regional moot so far. Texas, believe it or not, uh, is uh, biggest so far. We'll see, though. I don't know. L.A. Moot is uh, is gunning for it, so uh, so we'll see. Um, anyway, okay. Um, yeah, even attendance is bigger in Texas. That's just it. Okay. So anyhow, um, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do this. I'm not sure exactly where, by the way, in Texas it's gonna be. I think. Um, it was in Fort Worth last year. I think that there's a uh, there is a conspiracy on the part of Serena Higgins, our our language and literature department chair at Signum, to 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 move it down to Waco. She's at Baylor down, down there, so I think it, may, it might end up being around there, um, so a little further south, maybe either Waco or, or towards Austin, something like that. It's, I think, but I, but I'm not really sure. It's not it's not settled yet. Um, anyhow. But as I say, Bay Mood, that's, that's, what I was, that's what I was announcing. So do make sure uh, that you remember registration deadline, end of July. So August 18th is our day. Please do remember to sign up and come because it's going to be awesome. Now, let us get back uh, to uh, our discussion for this week of prominent hills and broken swords. Uh, we're going to continue looking at uh, this sort of thread of Aragorn's interest in Weathertop is something that I'm still tracing and still examining uh, throughout this um, um, throughout this whole section. So, um, 
Okay, so I'm going to um, one quick note, and I just got this this evening before class on Twitter uh, from Tom Hillman, and he just nailed it. You know, this some of those times when when you hear when somebody um, uh, when somebody sub, uh, uh, gives a reading, right, and it's just like as soon as you as soon as you hear it, like as soon as you hear the person's explanation, you're like, boom, like that's it, like that's of course that's it, like why did I never, um, why did I never see that before, right? Why did I never think of that before? Uh, Tom Hillman totally nailed it. Um, uh, the passage we spent a long time talking about last time. I hope the thinning process will not go on indefinitely, or I shall become a wraith is how I always read it, right? Tom says, emphasis on shall, not wraith, puts emphasis where it needs to be for Strider's response. Uh, So uh, Tom suggests that that line should be read, I hope the thinning process will not go on indefinitely or I shall become a wraith. And that's exa- that's it. That's exactly it. As soon as he said that, I'm like, yeah, of course. And that's why Strider jumps in and says, do not say such things, right? Um, and... Um, yeah, yeah. So I think that's that. That's exactly right. It, it's I. I definitely think as you know as I as I was saying last time, Strider is not. This is not a name the devil and he will appear kind of situation. This is Strider focusing on Frodo's own will. Right. Don't give into that. Don't even joke about it. Right. Don't uh, don't acclimate your own mind to this idea of your becoming a wraith. You need to keep your resistance at 100 percent to the concept that you are ever going to become a wraith. Right. And and Tom's exactly right. If you do put the emphasis on shall. Right. I hope the thinning process will not go on indefinitely or I shall become a wraith right? Shows, it's, it's not just that he's making a joke about becoming a wraith. When you, when you say it that way, right? Um, it suggests that Frodo's already been thinking about becoming a wraith, right? Like that he considers becoming a wraith as one of the likely things that's going to happen to him, right? You know, you, it's almost like you could, you could, uh, sort of parenthetically add, you know, or I shall, certainly become a wraith or I shall, or I'll definitely become a wraith. Right. Um, as if in the back of his mind, again, he's entertaining the idea. Right. Um, and so he's still joking, right? I mean, he's joking about weight loss, right? It's not, he's not serious. And yet again, it does betray, uh, a really, um, a potential weakening of his resolve, like just a tiny little chink, uh, in the, in the wall of his, of his will, but that I think is what Strider is picking up on. So, so yeah, I just, again, and, and this is not the first time I've had this experience, uh, with Tom Hillman's suggestions. Uh, you know, Tom is such a good reader. So, uh, thanks Tom for that. I, absolutely. You completely nailed it. Um, yeah, yeah. Now that's a very interesting point. Um, a trifle Sauron fancies uh, is the uh, username here. So trifle um, says the only problem I have with this is giving up all hope is exactly how Frodo responds consistently and arguably how he gets through Mordor. That is very true. And the, the question of hope and hopelessness, that's going to be a major theme that we're going to be looking at, especially once we get to book four, right? To the Frodo and Sam uh, uh, half of the two towers. Um, I, so, because that's, I agree, that is a super interesting and complicated thing to look at. Uh, you know, it's, it's very, it's, it's sort of, you don't have to read the book very many times before you see that hope is a, is a really important theme, right? And yet, you can read it very many times and still have, I think, the full complexity of that theme um, get past you. And I'm not sure that I myself fully understand it yet. So I'm really looking forward to taking our time and working through that uh, in detail. So we'll totally get there, but I'm not going to worry about that quite yet. Uh, Trifle, if anything, we can look at this as kind of an early piece of data, right? That we might want to come back and remember this exchange between Frodo and Aragorn when we do get there and we look at, you know, when this becomes a bigger issue for Frodo on his approach to, uh, uh, to Mordor. Um, okay, good. Um, all right. So 
uh, yeah, no, Emma Thorne, you're right. Uh, he, uh, uh, Strider's not warning them that they better feed Frodo. No, it has nothing to do with it. Frodo's actual girth here. Um, okay, cool. So thanks, Tom, for that. Let's get back to the text now. The hills drew nearer. They made an undulating ridge, often rising almost to a thousand feet, and here and there falling again to low clefts or passes leading into the eastern land beyond. Along the crest of the ridge, the hobbits could see what looked to be the remains of green-grown walls and dikes, and in the clefts there still stood the ruins of old works of stone. By night they had reached the feet of the westward slopes, and there they camped. It was the night of the 5th of October, and they were six days out from Bree. In the morning they found, for the first time since they had left the Chetwood, a track plain to see. They turned right and followed it southwards. It ran cunningly, taking a line that seemed chosen so as to keep as much hidden as possible from the view both of the hilltops above and of the flats to the west. It dived into dells and hugged steep banks, and where it passed over flatter and more open ground on either side of it, there were lines of large boulders and hewn stones that screened the travelers, almost like a hedge. Okay. Um, what, do we, um, what do we notice here? Right. Well, first of all, my uh, my subtitle for this uh, passage today um, is uh, for you know, this this passage here is "Old Castles with an Evil Look." That's another quote from The Hobbit. Right, as uh, Bilbo and the dwarves were passing through this particular area, uh, the narrator describes ruins that Bilbo can see off in the distance, um, and uh, it looks like old castles with an evil look, as if they had been built by evil people, um, by wicked people. So. Um, Anyway, so that that's this. Uh, uh, I, I'm, this is not one of those castles, obviously, but again, this that that same sense of old ruins, old ruins, which in the Hobbit are being described as actively ominous, right? Um, it's it's clearly one of those kinds of things, anyway, that they are that they are nearby here. Um, yeah. Um, let's see. Um, I, JJ, I also find it interesting that the path is meant, seems meant anyway, to hide travelers from the hilltops. Um, one question that I have, which I, I don't think we can necessarily answer uh, definitively here from the text, but um, the question I have is, how old is this path? Are they following an old road, um, like an old Dunedine road? Uh, was was the path that they're, that they're following made by the original occupants, right, uh, the people who built those structures which are now ruins, or is it a modern path, right? We know, as Strider's going to tell us very soon, that rangers come here, right? Um, and it certainly seems possible uh, that they come this way often enough that they have made a path. And being rangers and all kind of stealthy and possibly a little paranoid, the idea that they would, A, come to Weathertop regularly in order to be able to spy out the land, and B, want to be able to approach Weathertop without being seen for miles around by everybody who else who might happen to be near Weathertop. That kind of seems like a sort of a ranger thing, right? So it wouldn't shock me if this were a modern path in this way. Um, and yet, um, uh, I... I'm not sure. Um, it does sound, um, Rinru says the description is reminiscent of a Roman road fallen into, into disrepair. Um, it, yes, it could be something like that. I, I definitely could be an old road. Um, the way that the road is, is described running, cun running cunningly, um, uh, diving into dells, uh, the thing that most suggest that I find most suggestive about for the potential antiquity of this particular path uh, is the business about the boulders, um, uh, where it passed over flatter and more open ground on either side of it. There were lines of large boulders and hewn stones that screened the travelers almost like a hedge. Right, rangers didn't do that very likely. Right, it's hard to see rangers saying, hey, let's make a huge boulder hedge in order to better screen this road. It's not impossible, but that makes it sound like this is a relic of an older road. Um, so, I mean, I guess if I had to, if I had to vote, 
um, I would I would suggest that it. Uh, I, I, I guess if I if I had to decide, I would decide that it was an older road. Um, fourth thought was just thinking that rangers wouldn't leave a path. Well, maybe maybe not. I mean, yeah, you're right. Perhaps uh, they would be too stealthy and sneaky to take exactly their same path so that they actually wear a, a visible path. Um, yeah, yeah, and I agree. Um, uh, <laughs> It's a long name to say. I'll call you Nick. Uh, I agree, Nick, that the the, the description of the stones as because it does describe them. Yes, hewn stones. Yes, um, does does imply indeed that it was constructed. I agree. There's there's no there's no gesture at the idea that those are just natural rocks. There, right? Um, the large boulders could be the hewn stones. Definitely not. Um, and the fact that they screen the travelers seems very likely. Um, Bruin here, it is possible that these were thrown here by stone giants. Seems unlikely, uh, all things considered. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Let's see. Um, Tiber, so that, Tiber's thinking about, you know, would the originator, you know, with the people who originally constructed this, would they want the road to be hidden from Weathertop? Well, it depends on who built the road, right? Um, we know very little, um, we know very little about the, uh, uh, actual, di like, the, we don't know that much detail, right? We know a fair bit about what happened here in general terms, but not in specifics, right? We know there was a tower at Weathertop. We know that the tower of Weather at Weathertop was a, a a major point of contention, right? That there was a prolonged period of time in which uh, at least two, and possibly all three, of the rival Dunedain kingdoms, um, uh, the you know during the Arnorian Civil War, were fighting for Weathertop, right? Not only because it's an obvious position of strength, uh, and whoever controls Weathertop can not only see all around, but has a, a the strongest defensive position in this entire region, but also, of course, because there was a Palantir on Amonsul. So, um, for this reason, we know that they were contending over this. It was controlled by Arthodyne, but at least Rudauer and probably Cardolan uh, were uh, trying to access it, right? We're trying to take it. Which means... Um, uh, Here's what I mean when I say we don't know too much about exactly how, like, exactly the details. Um, I can easily imagine people who would want to screen the approach to Weathertop from the view at the top. Now, you're, uh, you're right, uh, somebody, I forget who it was already, um, that, like, the, 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 the people of Arthodyne would not build such a path, right? Because they controlled Weathertop. Um, they would not want uh, it to be, they, they would want to be able to see everything all around, right? But the people who are besieging Weathertop would. Right. Um, and it seems quite possible that the Rudarans were coming in from the north here. And so therefore, um, this could have been this path, although the tower is part of Arthodyne, right? This path could have been built and those rocks and hewn stones and things uh, erected by the the people of Rudaur who were besieging this place for quite a while, um, many years. So plenty of time to uh, make hidden ways or concealed ways so that the numbers of their, you know, so that their troop movements uh, could be uh, conducted without being seen from the top of the tower. Um, anyway, um, yeah, JJ says, how far would this path be from Weathertop? Lotro is messing with my sense of distance again. They get there, it seems to be hours, right? I mean, it's certainly, uh, well... Let's try to keep track of this, right? We do get the timing, and I saw uh, briefly uh, Tony and Tom talking about that passage, the uh, the date, the timestamp that we get at the end of that first paragraph. By night they had reached the feet of the westward slopes, and there they camped. It was the night of the 5th of October, and they were six days out from Bree. Um, and then in the morning, the, the next day, is the day they're going to get to Weathertop, right? Um, so... It doesn't take only a couple hours, right? They're traveling on this road for part of a day, and then they 
camp overnight and then the next day they come down uh to weathertop so um uh it's yeah yeah uh, jj within sight but not within bow shot yes but of course you know many 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 miles are within sight of of weathertop right of the top of weathertop or certainly within sight from weathertop um so uh uh so yeah yeah that would be uh, that would be relatively simple. Pontine says maybe the road was built in the days of Elendil. Possibly, but see, in the days of Elendil, uh, in the days of the United Arnor, they would not be making concealed paths, right? If if we're operating under the, the idea that those, that those rocks, those boulders and hewn stones, were put there in order to screen the road from view from Weathertop, um, there's absolutely no reason for the uh, the old Arnorian kingdom, you know, for d- people of during in the old Arnorian kingdom to do that, right? They just they just wouldn't have done. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Freya wasn't the last fall of Weathertop uh, uh, through the Angmar conquest. Yes, yes, Rudaur and Angmar. Um, yeah, well, the final battle really of that, you know, the sort of the final fall of the. Arnorian kingdom was at Fornost, um, uh, which of course we already saw in game a while back. Uh, we toured that, um, but Amonsul did fall during that. Before that, I believe I'm not remembering my dates. Uh, I think the fall of the Tower of Amonsul is in. Is that in Appendix B? I think it's in Appendix B. I'm not remembering exactly. Somebody look it up in Appendix B and tell me uh, the distance between the fall of... If the fall of Tower of the Tower of Amonsul was mentioned, I can't even remember that for sure, if that's there. But if it is, tell me the, what's the time gap between the fall of the Tower of Amonsul and uh, the fall of Fornost. Um, yeah. Um, anyway, okay. Um... And yes, Rinrus, you are right that the main road uh, would have been presumably the older Arnorian path. Yes, exactly. That would have been, it probably would have been by the, the main road uh, that Elendil would have come to Amonsul, right? So, yeah, yeah. Um, he wouldn't have gone this roundabout way. There was no need, right? There was no, um, there was no conflict. He was in no conflict with anyone in these, in these areas. Okay, so Third Age 1409, Tony, is when... That's the fall of Amonsul, is it? Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Um, cool. All right. Um, okay, right. 1409, during the fall of Cardolan. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I, I need to I need to go back and review those dates. Appendix B is great reading um, when you're looking for particular things, right? That's the thing. It's the problem is that I find reading through Appendix B, so you just get overwhelmed by numbers, right? And it's hard for me to, uh, you know, when I'm just kind of so like, I'm going to read Appendix B, um, it's it's really hard to latch on to things. But when you go hunting for things, it's really, really fun. Fornost Falls in 1974, right? Of course, of course, I should have remembered that the year of my birth. So uh, not third age, 1974. But uh, anyway, yeah, so that one always sticks out to me whenever I see it, but I always forget. Right, so 1974, so goodness, yo, holy cow, yeah, 500 years, 500 years before the fall of Fornost. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, cool. Okay, all right, so 500 years, so absolutely. Um, uh, that's really interesting. Um Yeah, I'm just thinking about what that means. So I'm getting distracted for a second thinking about what that would mean for the Bree lands, right? As presumably with the fall of Amonsul, uh, and we know that the Palantir is then taken up to Fornost because, of course, that's why uh, King Arvegui has both of them, right? The um, the the one from Enuminous and the one from uh, Amonsul with him when he goes uh, up to Forakel in the north. Um, but um, anyhow... Uh, But you got to think then that they will have withdrawn 
Arthodyne will have withdrawn from the Breelands around that. I mean, and when, once they've lost Amon Sul, um, Fornost is going to become their is going to become their uh, their thing, right? Their output. And it's not, not we know it's their strongest place, but um, it's going to become something like their southern boundary now, right? I mean, they don't have any strong places that we know of uh, other than Fornost in the North Downs. Anyway, sorry, just speculating. Um, yeah. Anyway, cool. All right. Um, I'll skip the first paragraph. Is there anything else I wanted to talk about there? Uh, yeah, the remains of green-grown walls and dikes. And in the clefts there still stood ruins of old works of stone. Um, one of the things that's not clear is exactly what they're seeing, right? That is, are they seeing merely military fortifications? It kind of sounds that way with walls and dikes. Um, uh, just their gazebos. <laughs> it says boomful. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so... The sense that Aragorn is going to give is that they didn't really live here, even in, even in even back in the you know back in the day, right? Even back in the in the fifteenth century, third age, they didn't live here at Amansul. It was still just an outpost, uh, just a watchtower. Um, so this seems to be a place which was always remote, um, which was never there was never a city here. Right. Um, so I don't think that what they're seeing are is evidence of of a of a settlement, right? Of anything like a city, but probably uh, remnants of fortifications and lines of defense uh, that were made at various points in the siege of Amansul. Um, okay. All right. Let's keep going. I wonder who made this path and what for, said Mary, as they walked along on one of these avenues where the stones were unusually large and close set. I'm not sure I like it. It has a, well, a rather barrow whitish look. Is there any barrow on Weathertop? No, there is no barrow on Weathertop nor on any of these hills, answered Strider. The men of the West did not live here, though in their latter days they defended the hills for a while against the evil that came out of Angmar. This path was made to serve the forts along the walls. But long before, in the first days of the North Kingdom, they built a great watchtower on Weathertop. Amon Sul, they called it. It was burned and broken, and nothing remains of it now but a tumbled ring, like a rough crown on the old hill's head. Yet once it was tall and fair. It is told that Elendil stood there, watching for the coming of Gilgalad out of the west, in the days of the Last Alliance. Okay. Um... So here's Aragorn confirming what I was just referring to, right? The men of the West did not live here. One interesting little thing here. Notice, first, Mary's observation, right? Mary looks at all these ruins, and he says, this has a rather barrow whitish look, right? He doesn't like the look of this place. Um, and it, it's interesting, I'm not really sure... What exactly Mary means by that? That is, does this mean this looks like the ruins of, you know, construction from an era like these are, they look and they remind me of the standing stones back in, that we saw in the, in the Barrow Downs. Um, is there something about them that looks like it might be made by the same kind of people? I mean, how detailed is Mary's, uh, uh, is Mary's observation here. It could be nothing other than we've been in apparently barren places, uh, barren hilly regions where there were lots of like random monoliths and standing stones around and that was bad news, right? Um, have we put our you know head in the same kind of noose again? It might be really uh, just as um, just as simple uh, as that, as Boomful says, that could be Mary's only other example of large hewn stones, right? Um, and you're absolutely right, Bruinier, that Mary doesn't have that much frame of reference uh, to compare it to. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, and that's the thing, uh, Trifle, is that, yes, the people of Cardolan did hole up there in the Barrow Downs and used the Barrows, 
But uh, the Barrow Downs predate the Kingdom of Cardolan pretty significantly, right? It's the, the it was made they were made by the original uh, re- residents of that land before the Dunedain came back. So, um, in fact, what Mary is probably it seems very doubtful that very many of the standing stones uh, in the Barrow Downs were put there by Dunedain. Um, presumably, they predate the Dunedain. Um, and so what he's looking at here is old, right? It's legitimately old. He's looking at at least, I mean, if, if, we're, if, if we are right in thinking that these hewn stones and, and, and thing, you know, the uh, unusually large and close set stones that they're walking along next to at this particular point, if we're right in dating those to around that time, right, to the time of the siege of Amansul, uh, back around 1400-ish, um, then they're old, right? You know, these are 1,500-year-old stones. Uh, so those would be, you know, like Anglo-Saxon barrows to us, right? Date, you know, just years, number of years-wise. Um, and yet, uh, that's way younger than the standing stones in the Barrow Downs. Now, again, Mary has a relatively limited experience. Uh, really old rocks look like really old rocks, right? Um, but but I wonder, right? Um, you know, Matt says he could also be getting the Angmar vibe associated with the conquest of both places. Yeah. And, of course, I can't help... I can't forget that... It was Mary who had the close encounter there in the Barrow Downs, right? It was Mary who had that encounter with the memory of the presumably old Cardolan prince um, whose barrow he shared and in which he almost took up permanent residence. So um, it's possible that he is picking up on... that he's doing more than just casually saying, hey, look, big cut stones. I've seen those before in the Barrow Downs. And it's possible that he's even doing more than saying, oh, I note there are some cultural similarities between, you know, these stones and the stones that we saw at various points in the in the Barrow Downs. Um, they were presumably... There's a, there's a cultural link between those people. It's possible that he's picking up on something more... Uh, uh, I don't know what spiritual, right? It's possible. It's possible. Oh, hi, Dane. Um, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it is also well. I wonder. I wonder. Um, yeah. Uh, Blancsmont said it's cool that his vision now almost acts like a memory for him near Weathertop. Um, yeah, yeah. I, um. But notice at the same time, his question, is there any barrow on Weathertop, is, um, well, I, I don't, um, I don't like to accuse him of being simplistic, but that's a little, well, nah, it's not fair. If you're only experience is the Shire and the Old Forest and the and the Barrow Downs, right? Uh, and you're seeing these ruins and these old stones and you see the one prominent hill. The Barrows were on hilltops in the Barrow Downs, right? So I guess it's not a silly question to say, is there any Barrow on Weathertop? And I'm trying to remember what they have been told and if they have been told anything yet um, uh, um, Strider here is is saying uh, hmm, talking about the, the great watchtower yeah, I don't think he hasn't said anything about the watchtower to this point yet has he always talked about is the hill and the view that you can have from the top of the hill right so um, yeah yeah um, yeah, um, 
I, Mad Violinist and Tony Mead are both remembering the visions conjured by Bombadil, right? Um, Mad Violinist says, under the spell of Tom's songs, they all had visions of the past, including the green walls and the white walls rising out of the grass. Um, there might be a similarity there, too. Um, that is one thing that I was briefly thinking about, if we could just go back for a second. Along the crest of the ridge, the hobbits could see what looked to be the remains of green-grown walls and dikes, and in the clefts there still stood the ruins of old works of stone. That could be very different uh, uh, historical periods that they're seeing remnants of, right? Uh, thinking, Mad Violinist, of the passage you're quoting about um, uh, from Tom Bombadil, it is possible that they're seeing some remnants of a much older time and some remnants of the Dunedinian period there. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tom says, if I had been held by a white in a barrow, I would have asked about a barrow too. Uh, yeah, it's certainly, at the very least, an understandable paranoia on Mary's part, right? Um, I'm seeing things that look kind of similar to what to some of the things we saw in the Barrow Downs. There's not a barrow there, is there? Um, and of course, Partly what we get there is a bit of a recollection of that same thing with the shortcut, right? Um, you know, in this case, it's Mary himself. Like, he was leading, he was trying to lead them across the Barrow Downs, and it did not go well, right? And they got the fog and the nap and the waking up and being captured by Barrow Whites, and this that went south in a hurry, right? And now here, there's a, there's, there's, there's a kind of probing, I think, of Strider. Like, you're not... There's not a barrow. You're not leading us to where there's a barrow, is there, right? Because we have played that game before, and I'm not playing again, right? Um, so I think it's, it's, it is very possible. <laughs> Irinda says maybe Mary's thinking bigger hill, bigger barrow, right? Yeah, like, imagine how big and powerful is the barrow white who lives on that puppy, right? Maybe, yeah, maybe that is Mary's thought there. Um, yeah, yeah. And yes, you're right, Trifle, that Mary is commenting on the path and calling it Barrow Whitehish, not the hill itself, right? But again, you can see Mary the association in Mary's mind is clear, right? If 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 this area immediately around us here looks Barrow Whitish, looks kind of like what we've seen, what we saw when we were traveling through the hills uh of the Barrow Downs. Um and there were barrows on the hilltops, right? So we're going to this hilltop that looks like the place where the king of all the Barrow Whites would live, right? I mean, obviously. So um, uh, let's uh, uh, let's let's clear that right up. You know, Mary seems to be thinking. Um, Strider's answer is interesting to me because. Who was it? I, I forget. It, it passed me by a little while back about how Strider's... Somebody was making a comment that Strider's response... Yes, Fourth Dauntless, it was you. Um, the ancestry of the Barrow makes Aragorn's response a non sequitur. Yes, I was thinking the same thing, right? Um, there is no Barrow on Weathertop nor in any of these hills. The men of the West did not live here. Well, wait, hang on a second. Is that what makes Barrows? Right? That doesn't... I don't... I'm not following. I'm not following Aragorn's line of thinking there between his... those two sentences. Right? There is no Barrow. The men of the West did not live here. Uh, because, of course, we know, yes, men of the West did live on the Barrow Downs, but that's almost accidental. Right? The Barrows predate them. Uh, and... Or, I don't know, is it? Maybe it's not, right? I mean, after all, if Aragorn is making this connection and it sounds to me like a non sequitur, it's quite possible, of course, that Aragorn is right and I am not. Um, so let's think about this in one other step. Um, Mary, obviously, has just explicitly raised the issue of not just of Barrow Whites. He's not just asking, like, are there... There aren't graves around here, are there? Because I'm kind of superstitious about graves. That's not Mary's point. He's like, you know, Mary's question is very openly, are we likely to encounter the walking dead anywhere around here? Right? That's his question. To which Aragorn is responding, no. Um, and that seems to me, and he, he says, no, the men of the West did not live here. 
right? Remember how the barrow whites came to be. Not the construction of the barrows, but the infestation of the barrows with the dark spirits, right? They were sent out of Angmar by the witch king, right? So presumably, if the men of the West had not gone to live in the barrow downs, there wouldn't be any barrow whites there in the Barrow Downs, right? Just because you have graves doesn't mean you have undead. It's not just a thing that spontaneously happens, right? Um, so the haunting of the Barrow Downs is, in a sense, the logical consequence of the Dunedain living there, right? They didn't cause it, but it only happened because they're there, right? Um, so um, I wonder if that is the link that Strider is thinking of, right? That uh, <clears throat> the Barrow Downs, or rather, again, to be more precise, the infestation of the Barrow Downs by the dark spirits sent out of Angmar, um, that infestation was a deliberate attack against the people of Cardolan, right? It was, it, it was the, attempting to destroy them. Um, it was a counterattack against the Dunedain by the Witch King. Um, now, a couple of you before, I uh, was noticing again before, <coughs> um, that we're asking about, like, what on earth did the Dunedain do with their dead? Uh, because even if they didn't live here, they were fighting here, and so therefore presumably died here. Um, I, uh, I don't know. Um... Irinda says there's no point in raising the dead if there are no living to Harry. Uh, perhaps? Perhaps? I don't know. This opens up a whole series of questions to which I will tell you in advance I have no idea what the answer is, right? So, okay. Does this suggest that there are certain conditions that are required in order to have the kind of barrow whitish infestation that happens in the barrow downs. Um, they are not just the spontaneously risen corpses of the dead, as we talked about before, but if spirits from Angmar come in, can they infest any old grave? Maybe they can't infest any old grave. Maybe there has to be a barrow, right? Uh, because, of course, barrows are different, right? They're, barrows are special places. Is that kind of a special of space, that kind of a that kind of a uh, that kind of a dedicated place required for the kind of thing that the spirits do in manifesting themselves as barrow whites. Um, I don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe you know, a bunch of Numenorean soldiers buried in in you know quiet, unmarked graves near Amonsul, you know, aren't going to do the trick. Um, uh, I don't, uh, I don't really know. Um, uh, is, would it be, as uh, somebody was suggesting, um, uh, Irindus, I think, uh, that since they didn't live here, there was no point in infesting anything, right? There was nobody to, uh, there, there was nobody to plague, right? So why bother plaguing them? Um, since they didn't seem to be a, a strike force, exactly. Um, but I keep going back to the Barrow Downs. I think of, I keep thinking of Tom's words, um, of how we're told that the spell of the, of the mound will be broken and the Barrow White will never be enabled to return, right? Again, that's what I mean when I say there's something about this spot, right? It's not just a wandering spirit looking for a corpse to animate, right? And it's like, hey, found a moldering corpse. I'm in business, right? That does not, that is not how the Barrow Whites work, right? Um, there is a spell laid on this place, on that spot, on the Barrow itself, um, which connects the Barrow White to it, such that even if that Barrow White is banished by Tom Bombadil and sent off to, we're not quite sure where, um, possibly the Gates of Night, possibly not, um, then um, uh, still another Barrow White could... In, could take up habitation, right? Unless the spell on the barrow is broken. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so Lincoln, I, I, I do think it's important to note, he said, there is no barrow on Weathertop nor on any of these hills, right? Um, perhaps if the men of the West had lived here, they would have made tombs, 
right? And perhaps those tombs could be habitations of spirits that would make barrow whites or tomb whites or whatever. Uh, it's uh, that's possible that that's what it, you know, that that's the implication of men of the West did not live here. Um, but again, in any case, I, I don't think it's about the question of the presence or absence of corpses. Did the Dunedain bury their dead here? in non-tombs, right, just in the ground, and then therefore that doesn't give the Barrow Whites an opportunity. Did they send their dead home? Um, uh, we don't know. We don't know. Um, yeah. Uh, it certainly is possible, Mad Violinist, that Tolkien never resolved this question. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and maybe he contemplated an Arnorian origin for the Barrows. Yes, it is, of course, always possible that we are seeing a relic of a, an earlier stage of Tolkien's thought when he was imagining that the Barrow Downs were definitely an Arnorian construction, not predating the Arnorians, um, and that he added that later on. But if I'm remembering The Return of the Shadow, most of that Tom Bombadil stuff, the vision and all those things, I'm pretty sure... Um, one of you can maybe check The Return of the Shadow for me now... Uh, to confirm. But if I remember correctly, in The Return of the Shadow, when we first meet Tom Bombadil and do the po Tom Bombadil section, um, which is way early, like phase three or something of the uh, of the early manuscripts, um, I think most of that stuff about the Barrow Whites is there. Um, so I'm pretty sure that the Barrow Downs concept predates the Arnorian stuff wholesale, I think. Um, because the whole the history the later history of the kingdom of Arnor very much predates it. I mean there's no there was only the vague by the time we get to the council of Elrond there's only the vaguest sense. The first time we get to the council of Elrond there's not even a strider much less a kingdom of Arnor, right? I mean there aren't even any men. Uh you know the part of strider is played by Trotter the hobbit with wooden shoes. So um now when strider when Trotter becomes uh, a man, right, he does become an old, you know, a Dunedain um, associated with them, and we do get the growth of a, something like a northern kingdom, a northern city anyway, Fornos, Norbury of the Kings, was originally like the whole, where the Dunedain came up in the north and established their kingdom. So in Tolkien's planning, in his, in the story development process in Tolkien's mind, Tom Bombadil and the Barrow Downs vastly predate the Kingdom of Arnor. Uh, so I would be very surprised if it worked the other way around. I mean, if if he was thinking... Now, of course, it's possible that later on he's deciding to change it back and decide that now he's going to retcon it into, into being an Arnorian construction. But, um, yeah, Tony, exactly. The Black Riders originally were Barrow Whites. Um, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that was... They were... Um, they were identified uh, with each other the, fir the first time they went into the Old Forest. Uh, Frodo and company went into the Old Forest. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and yet, for Thoughtless, absolutely, the idea of the Barrows comes from the importing of Tom Bombadil. Uh, many of you, of course, will remember that in the poem, The Adventures of Tom Bombadil, where the character is developed, there's a Barrow White, right? The Barrow White, uh, you know, Goldberry, the Barrow White, Old Man Willow, those are all original uh uh, characters in uh, in the poem. So yeah, the idea of the Barrow and the Barrow White is uh, is certainly uh, old. Um, even the description and placement of the Barrow here um, is uh, a big interesting little side conversation here. Wondering where Arathorn was buried and uh, Ambrosius Aurelianus saying it's interesting that so little is made of. Uh, uh, of Aragorn's father or his grave. Yeah, it's true. Um, I'm tempted to kind of make something of that, actually. Um, that uh, I would not... It would seem to me to fit. I can't think of any reason we have to believe... Uh, to any, any positive evidence to support this concept. Um... But to, I, to me, it seems very uh, sensible uh, to say that the Dunedain, the, um, in, in this sort of final stage of the Northern Kingdom, right, with the, the chieftains of the Dunedain, that they would be actively anti-burial memorials, right? That's been a thing, 
right? It's been a kind of a Numenorian issue for several millennia now, right? Back in Numenor, uh, we did the whole death and necromancy and embalming thing, right? And then in in the uh, at the you know in, in the decline of Gondor, they kind of did the whole necro thing and the elaborate tombs and stuff. So um, I would suspect if I were so, like, say, if anybody asked me about, uh, you know, kinds of elements for Dunedain culture, I don't know, if you were, like, making a TV series about the adventures of young Aragorn, what I would tell them is I would have the Dunedain have d- deliberately simplistic burial rites. Uh, no, uh, no big burial grounds or marked burial grounds or anything. I think that they would be sort of aggressively anti-tomb, right? Uh, as sort of a part of the, like, learning from history, we don't want to go the way uh, of the others. Um, and Tony, it is interesting that we get Gilrine's grave, uh, but not Arathorn's. Yeah. Gilrine is buried in Rivendell, right? And so, therefore, presumably her grave is marked uh, by probably by the elves um but um anyway yeah <laughs> hey Rin Roos, i'm i am happy to bestow my ideas on anybody who's making a tv series about young aragorn i'd love to have as many conversations with them as they would like to have absolutely <laughs> no, that's a freebie that's a freebie no problem um yeah cool um, yeah, uh, Mike says the Dunedain have looped ar- around past ancestor worship and are back on the symbolic high ground again. Yeah, in a sense. So it's though it's less about ancestor worship than about like paranoia about death, right? Um, yeah, yeah, and it's certainly true, Matthew, that the Rangers keeping a low profile would not have like a big prominent resting place. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Anyway, cool. Okay. What else did I want to say? Oh, there is more I wanted to say about this slide. Um, Interesting. The path was made to serve the forts along the walls. Whose forts? Which forts? Which walls? Right? Again, we don't know anything about the tactical situation here. Were these Rudaran forts as they were investing... uh, 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 You know, Amonsul, Weathertop, right? Um... Or are they, uh, um, or, or, you know, were they Arthodinian, Arthodinian forts? Right? You know, I, I don't know. Uh, it's a, uh, my sense of it, my temptation would be to say, you know, my inclination, I should say, uh, not too much temptation involved here. My inclination would be to say that they would be Rudauran forts because, again, they, the whole purpose of the construction and layout of this path seems to be to hide from Weathertop itself, uh, which would seem to be the motivation of the people attacking Weathertop rather than the people defending it. Um, yeah, yeah. And, um, oh, uh, Dime, you're right. Cremation would be sort of Nordic. And there is, Tolkien does speak of burials at sea, uh, sort of Viking-esque um, uh, sea uh, boat burials as being associated with, but it's like associated with the people who were there before the Numenorians. Um, uh, yeah, it's, but, but anyway, that, that is definitely a concept, um, especially in the the early Numenorean stages. So back in, I'm looking over at my bookshelf here, back in the, the, the early Lost Road stuff, uh, when he's first working out the fall of Numenor and how it connects and using that as a sort of a bridge from like, like a sequel essentially to the book of lost tales, uh, to the age of elves as he was describing it. Um, yeah, exactly. For Thoughtless Gandalf does refer to cre- uh, cremation as a practice of heathen kings. Um, yeah, pre-Numenorean kings. And th- again, that seems to be the... Oops, sorry, I lost... I, I can hear from the music in the background here. And then I lost... That's one of the problems I've been having with my screen. I can't do my split screen the way that I was doing before. So, anyhow. Um, yeah, yeah. 
Um, and Veronica, yes, Denethor also is uh, alluding to uh, he and Faramir burning like the kings of old. Yeah, exactly. So, again, pre-Numenorean um, uh, concept there. Um, yeah, cool. Anyway, okay. Um, yes, mad violinist, I agree. The hidden paths could be like the approach trenches meant to keep the soldiers safe until he's in the front line. Yeah. Now, obviously, you know, in the war between Rudaur and Arthedain, you know, they weren't having to screen themselves from machine gun fire, so the motivations are different, and I would think, therefore, that the tactical situation would be different. No machine guns, no artillery, so uh, it seems to be less about, this path seems to be less about defense than about sight, lines of sight, right, and concealment of movement. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> do we know they had no machine bows? Yes, we do. Uh, uh, Tolkien did toy with the idea of modern technological advancement among the Numenorians, such that they had artillery and uh, probably guns and certainly iron sides and things like that when they invaded uh, uh, a Valinor uh, at the end. But he left that idea behind as he moved forward. Um, anyway, okay. Yeah, a goblin would have made it, Valori says. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Follow Strider's train of thought here. There's no barrel on Weathertop. The men of the West did not live here, though they defended the hills against the evil that came out of Angmar. So he acknowledges the war, that this was a war between the men of the West and the evil that came out of Angmar. Notice how he doesn't characterize this as a civil war. Right, um, he's not interested in like the conflicting claims of Arthedain and Rudaur. He sees things in much simpler terms. Right, there were the men of the West, and there was the evil out of Angmar that was attacking them. This path was made to serve the forts, but long before, in the first days of the North Kingdom, they built a great watchtower on Weathertop, Amon Sul, they called it. So yes, this date from the Civil War time. Right, but let's go back before that. Right, the tower here, Amonsul, the watchtower, was built during the time of Alentil. It was burned and broken, and nothing remains of it now but a tumbled ring like a rough crown on the old hill's head. Yet once it was tall and fair, it is told that Alendil stood there watching for the coming of Gilgalad out of the west in the days of the last alliance. I'm going to make a wild suggestion. I've been talking about Aragorn's motivation. Why does he want to go to Weathertop? Right? Getting a good look at the country roundabout is a good idea. Right? Sort of a good idea. I'm not 100% sure how much good it's necessarily going to do. Right? Um, maybe he can see whether or not the ring wraiths are on the road nearby, but what's he looking for? He knows they're after him, right? He knows they're going to be around. So, you know, I'm not convinced that, like, I must ascertain the whereabouts of the... Uh, I must ascertain the whereabouts of the, the ring rates. I'm not really convinced that that's the chief motivation here, right? Um, Tony Mead says he seems to be drawn to this like M on hand. Yes, Tarloniel, that's exactly my theory. He wants to stand where Elendil stood. Yes, he's carrying Elendil's sword, right? H that his broken primary weapon that still bothers Tony, right? That's he's carrying Elendil's sword, and it's not just that he's carrying Elendil's sword. Presumably, he's been carrying Elendil's sword for a while, and he's been to Weathertop many times. He's had many, many opportunities to reenact the standing like Elendil, watching out for Gilgalad, right? But this is different. Oh, Bruinier, I seem to be accidentally answering your question about how do you pronounce Gilgalad. I've always said Gilgalad. Um, Gilgalad might possibly be more accurate, but I've always said Gilgalad, and I don't plan to change. Um, I think the primary reason that I've always pronounced it Gilgalad is for, like, alliteration purposes. Um, but I have to say... Anyway, we'll come back to this, actually, in a little bit. Um... Yeah, Mike, this is an important moment, right? Um, the, uh, 
this is an important moment in um, his career, Aragorn's career, right? But I, again, just a theory, very little backing, except, again, the point, uh, you know, Tony, I think it was you just now who was was making that, uh, um, that he, uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, Tony, what is, sorry, I'm totally losing my concentration. Oh, yeah, being drawn like Emon Hen. Yes, yes. There's something about the moment here, right? Now, the Emon Hen thing is a little bit different because, of course, the power of seeing from Emon Hen, it's almost like having a Palantir, right? So, um, it's different. And we'll see when we, when we see Frodo sitting on Emon Hen what happens. But, um, uh, anyhow, uh, the parallel with the moment, right? Yes, he's done the tourist thing before. He's been to Weathertop and doubtless had that moment where he's like, I, right now, am standing where Elendo himself once stood, right? And I don't doubt that young Aragorn, uh, that this was a big moment for young Aragorn. Right? It could be something that happens in an episode in a TV series about young Aragorn. But anyway, um, it's, this is not just a tourist thing, right? This is a moment. At that time, right? The time of the, 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 the Battle of the Last Alliance, right? This is not just, you know, like Elendil stood here. Elendil stood here watching for the coming of Gilgalad out of the West in the days of the Last Alliance. Right, when the last alliance was formed, this is the place that it formed. This is the place where Elendil and Gilgalad came together. It is from here. It is from Weathertop, right, that Elendil and Gilgalad set out for Mordor to take down Sauron. Okay, that is huge. He, his whole adult life has been oriented towards this moment, essentially, right? The war on the shadow. And it's come. It's happening now, right? Now is that it's getting real now. And so he, and notice also that, that why are they coming to Weathertop? What's been the excuse? What's been the rationale? Because they might meet Gandalf, right? Um, the, the and, you know, and that's it's it's a weak parallel in one sense, right? I'm going to be like a Lendl and Gandalf's going to be like El, like Gilgalad, and we're going to get together, and we're going to. Um, but again, there's a that I that the the parallel, even though it's it's a weak parallel, Aragorn is not a or uh, Gandalf, right? neither one of them are like the lords of realms, and they're not going to come together and join forces and march triumphantly against uh, Mordor. But nevertheless, um, there's still that... I think that Aragorn can feel the weight of this moment, right? He is now setting out on his final journey to, towards Mordor. He knows this, right? Frodo and the Hobbits don't really know this yet, as we're going to see in a little bit. Um, maybe not tonight. Maybe next time. But we're going to see it in any case, uh, and quite soon. The Hobbits still don't understand where they're going and what they're doing, right? They're still just trying to get to Rivendell. That was plan A. They're still just trying to achieve plan A, uh, you know, get to Rivendell. Uh, and they don't, even Frodo, don't really know what's going to happen after that. Aragorn knows. He knows. He knows what his destiny is, right? The ring has been found. It is time. Now this is happening. We're going to be going to... Now the final war with the Shadow. It's time for me to go back towards Minas Tirith. It's time for me to help in what ways I don't yet really know uh, to overthrow the Shadow. This is the moment, right? And here he's trying to meet up with his ally at Weathertop. That sense of the historical parallelism. Right. That finally he is not just like a tourist standing on the place. You know, he's not just Elendil's heir carrying Elendil's sword standing on the place that Elendil, you know, where Elendil once stood. He's now at a parallel moment in his story. Right. Um, taking up arms against the enemy. And Tony soon 
effectual arms, <laughs> right, against the enemy uh, and setting out for Mordor. Um, so I, 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 I honestly, uh, I don't think I would have made this argument before, but as we've gone through and as I've thought through exactly how weak are the reasons for Aragorn to come to Weathertop, uh, this reason See, is has been kind of growing in my mind. Um, Tony Mead says that Aragorn often chooses the mythical over the practical. Yeah, it, well, broken sword, Tony, right? I'm going to carry the sword of Elendil, even though it's not m- much good, right? As he says to Sam. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, um, I think that. Uh, uh, yeah, now, Galandar says, uh, although the members of the Last Alliance spent several years preparing for the war at Rivendell, uh, so that seems a better place to say the Last Alliance set out. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Well, and they're going to do that, too, right? They're going to be recreating the entire thing. You know, it was the Last Alliance, but, of course, the Fellowship of the Ring, that's one of the points of the Fellowship of the Ring, right? It's one of the kind of subtexts. N- not the book, the, f- the group, right? One of the subtexts of the formation of the group that is going to be sent with the ring is this is the real last alliance, right? This makes Gilgo out and Elendil the penultimate alliance, right? Because we, once again, the free peoples of the world are joining together into a different kind of alliance. It's not an army, right? Um, but the Fellowship of the Ring is another sort of alliance, right? Um, so yeah, I think it's not just Aragorn who has a sense of the sort of historical moment here, right? Um, uh, so, yeah, uh, that, that I think is, is definitely a factor uh, for Aragorn uh, in this, um, uh, in his journey here. I got time. Whoa, hey, let's talk about the poem. <laughs> That's a great thing to do at 11 o'clock. Okay, the hobbits gazed at Strider. It seemed that he was learned in old lore, as well as in the ways of the wild. Who was Gilgalad? said Mary, but Strider did not answer, and seemed to be lost in thought. Suddenly a low voice murmured. Gilgalad was an elven king, of him the harpers sadly sing, the last whose realm was fair and free between the mountains and the sea. His sword was long, his lance was keen, his shining helm afar was seen, the countless stars of heaven's field were mirrored in his silver shield. But long ago he rode away, and where he dwelleth none can say, for into darkness fell his star in Mordor, where the shadows are. Okay, what do you notice about this poem? Um, first of all, you'll notice that I immediately pronounce Gilgalad the other way, because that's obviously what fits the meter of this poem. Uh, this poem is not only in... Uh, this poem is not only in iambic meter, but it's very regular iambic meter. Gilgal, it was an elven king, of him the harper sadly sing, the last whose realm was fair and free between the mountains and the sea. Is there even a, an off syllable in that entire stanza? It's very, very regular iambic meter. Um, and... Tarlonio, I love the integration of the line from the ring verse in Mordor, where the shadows are, right? Um, Listen to that. But long ago he rode away, and where he dwelleth none can say, for into darkness fell his star in Mordor, where the shadows are. Now, if you remember, in the ring verse itself, that line is not iambic, but trochaic. We talked about this, right? The, the, the ring verse is primarily trochaic with a significant exception, right? The exception being the text that's engraved on the ring itself, right? In the fire letters. Um, so three rings for the elven kings under the sky, seven for the dwarf lords in their halls of stone. That's trochaic. Strong syllable weak, strong weak. Three rings. Well, that's Spondy, but right. Seven for the dwarf lords in their halls of stone. Nine for mortal men doomed to die. One for the dark lord on his dark throne in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. Trochaic, right? And then it shifts to Iams. 
One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness bind them in the land of Mordor, where the shadows lie. And you can hear it, right? That Those two lines are a quotation. That's what's carved on the ring, right? They're quoting Sauron there. They're quoting Sauron's evil I am's, right? Set within their trochaic lore poem. So, in the land of Mordor, where the shadows lie on either side of those lines, are composed by the Elvish masters, right? The Elvish lore masters. And they quote Sauron's lines in the middle of it. Um, in Mordor, where the shadows are, Still, uh, it does, uh, so hang on a second, um, a belongs one is, wa- is wondering if, uh, the, uh, the Bilbo being in possession of the ring when he, uh, translated this would, uh, influence the rhythm. I wouldn't think so. Um, he, he didn't compose it, he translated it, as, uh, Aragorn is going to say. Um, uh... <laughs> Karina says, iambic uh, meter is better for enchanting folks. She says, I don't make the rules, but I'm pretty sure that's one. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, pause for a second. Notice notice the, the, the general form of this poem. What kind of poem is this? What does it sound like? And I don't mean what kind of poem. When I say what kind of poem, I don't mean... I'm not talking about, like, English teacher vocabulary here. I mean, in the context of the Fellowship of the Ring, we've read a bunch of poems so far already, right? Of the poems in the Fellowship of the Ring, which ones does it sound like, this poem? It's hard, because I've just been quoting the Ring Lore poem, so that's to so get this in your head again. Gilgalad was an elven king, of him the harpers sadly sing, the last whose realm was fair and free between the mountains and the sea. Careful, because this is kind of a trick question in some ways. Forget the content. Listen to the sound. Look at the shape. Right? Listen to the sound. Look at the shape. It's iambic. That first stanza almost perfectly iambic all the way through. Right? Iambic what? How many how many beats per line? Gilgalad was an elven king. Of him the harpers sadly sing. The last whose realm was fair and free between the mountains and the sea. Very neatly iambic tetrameter, right? In rhyming couplets. Elven king of him the harper sadly sing. The last whose realm was fair and free between the mountains and the sea. Yes, this is hobbit meter. Um, This is... Yes, O Loon is he that will not sing, O Water Hot is a Noble Thing. Absolutely. Um, though you notice, uh, Mad Violinist, how that second line, when I talk about the regularity, right? O Loon is he who will not sing, O Water Hot is a Noble Thing. It's an extra syllable in there, right? Which is cool. It's fun, especially when you're singing, especially in the bathtub, right? Uh, it's, it's not an imperfection. It's a feature, right? This is much more, this is much more uh, perfect. This is Hobbit meter. It's not just Hobbit meter, it's Hobbit style, right? The content, not Hobbitish, right? It doesn't say, you know, on the one hand, this poem sounds like it's worlds away from, you know, uh, um, uh, the, I mean, any, any, like the walking songs that they sing or the, ba- or the bath song or the drinking song, right? Um, so, you know, sing hey for the bath at close of day that washes the weary mud away. A loon is he who will not sing, right? Um, or ho, 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 to the bottle I go to ease my heart and drown my woe. Um, content very different. Form almost exactly the same, right? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Adamandir uh, says it's in Bilbo meter. Yeah, absolutely. It's in Bilbo meter. Um, this is Bilbo, it would seem, not only translating into. Um, common speech, right? He is translating into Hobbit style. Um, That's really interesting. I think that's really interesting. Um, And that seems to me very much what this poem is attempting to capture. Even the image, I mean, I don't want to 
make it sound like I'm trying to infantilize hobbits or that I'm accusing Bilbo of infantilizing hobbits, but it's very simple, right? Um, This sounds like not only a poem that you would sing among, you know, would recite to hobbits, um, but that you would recite to hobbit children, right? And come to think of it, that's exactly what happened, right? Sam heard this as a hobbit child, right? When he was being learned his letters uh, by by old Mr. Bilbo, right? Um, Listen to it, right? Um, Gilgalad was an elven king. Okay, so you need to learn this name, right? The name Gilgalad. The first thing to know is that he was an elven king, right? Of him the harpers sadly sing. That conveys to you that, A, he's a famous elfin king, right? There are lots of stories about him. And B, the stories are sad, right? The last whose realm was fair and free between the mountains and the sea. He was the last elven king who ruled in this in these lands nearby here, right? Marianne, exactly. This is a teaching song, right? Um, this is a teaching song. And that's exactly what happens, Right. Sam learned it off by heart. Right. And 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 notice it comes in it comes in response. Mary says, Who was Gilgalad? Right? And Sam is like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Gilgalad was an elven king. Of him the harper sadly sing. He knows the answer, right? Because he was taught it by old Mr. Bilbo. And this is the way that he was taught. Um, and Catriona, exactly, exactly. It's very sing-songy and thus easy to learn and repeat. The easiest verse to remember is the super, super regular way. I know I just pronounced uh, Gilgalad the other way. Wink. And again, I can't resist the I am's of this poem. Like, there is no resisting these I am's, right? I am helpless to resist the iambic structure of this poem, and I'm not going to try. I still prefer Gilgalad. And when I come across it in prose, that's what I shall say, generally. But when I am in the vicinity of this poem, I have to say Gogalad because that's obviously how it's meant to be pronounced here. And I'm inconsistent about that, and that's okay. I'm a grumpy old man, and I reserve the right. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, anyway, okay. Uh, Sam has learned it off, right? But, uh, but going back to what Catriona was saying, yes, the more regular the meter is, the more sing-songy it is, the easier it is for the hobbit child to remember, right? Um, uh, yeah, exactly, Pontine. Mary asks the question, and Sam answers the question, uh, answers the question in song. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, cool. Um, <laughs> sorry, I just I'm just laughing at people who are making who are making fun of my age. I know I'm not that old, but you know, I I, I I'm I'm old. I'm old enough. I'm old enough to be stubborn and unapologetic about it. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, Tony, you're right. Um, uh, the line, and where he dwelleth none can say, is really interesting, right? Um, but long ago he rode away, and where he dwelleth none can say, for into darkness fell his star in Mordor, where the shadows are. Um Yes, it, I, I agree with you that that openly acknowledges. Uh, again, this is, it's like an introduction. You know, the Hobbit child's introduction to, um, uh, you know, immortality, right? Um, because uh, um, I don't, I'm not sure, Mad Violence, that I would call it sanitizing for young readers exactly, but it's, it's, it's sort of like, we're not going to get into the in-depth theology of this question right now, but we need to acknowledge the fact that although elves can be killed, they're still around, right? So, I mean, if you said of a human, like an old human hero who had died, you know, where he dwells now, nobody can say you're just being evasive, right? Uh, probably, unless it's King Arthur, but generally you're being evasive if you talk like that. But not with elves. It's literally true, right? Uh, where he dwells, none can say. Who knows? 
Is he still in Mandos? Might still be in Mandos. Did he get loose already? I don't know. If he did, where is he hanging out now? I have no idea, right? Is he living in Tyrion now? Is he in Tolaresia? Who knows, right? Um, but the point is, uh, it notice it says three. Th- long ago, he rode away to Mordor, right? Where he and and also by the way, oh, I never noticed this before. Notice the frame of reference. Right, the frame of reference of that first line. Long ago he rode away. Away from where? Away from these lands. Away from the Shire, right? Gilgalad was an elven king, the last whose realm was fair and free between the mountains and the sea, of which the land of which the Shire is a part, right? Gilgalad is like our, the last of our elvish kings who was in our area, right? But long ago he rode away, away from us, right? Away from this realm that he once ruled. Right, um, and where he dwelleth, none can say. Why can't we say where he lives anymore? Because his star fell into darkness. Right, he was killed, and so we don't know where he is. But that, but he's not gone. Right. Again, this would be evasive if it were about a human. It's merely informative. Right. Uh, uh, it's uh, like a brief introduction. Uh, a brief introduction to Elvish Immortality for Hobbit children. Um, and yes, uh, uh, Mad Violinist, it is a, a, a really cool wordplay on his name. Into Mordor, uh, for into darkness fell his star, right? Um, yes, yes. Um, and yes, DMA Gilgawad would have ridden through the Proto Shire, very likely. Um, and that's kind of fun to think about, isn't it? Um, he would have ridden right through Mickle Delving and right through the... I mean, so, you know, talk about going to Weathertop and saying, like, Elendil once stood here, right? They can go to, like, Bywater and say, you know, Gilgalad probably stood here. Um, absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, okay, uh, <laughs> Gilgalad was an elven king. Uh uh, though where he dwelleth, none can say. And by the way, I'm going to pronounce it with the emphasis on the second syllable in your screen name every single time because you've invoked the I am's, right? And I can't help it. Um, uh, so uh, uh, Gilgalad is claiming that where he dwelleth, none can say is, is a lot more accurate for men because no one but a Luvatar knows the final destiny of men. Yes, but it is purely euphemistic to say that they dwell anywhere. They don't dwell right? They're done with the dwelling. They have gone, right? And you could say, sure, they're dwelling, they're dwelling apart, but the dwelling suggests that he's alive somewhere. We just don't know where, right? With men, yes, their souls have gone somewhere else, but it's more complicated. Right? I mean, again, if you wanted to be like, well, he's gone away now and we don't know where he is anymore. Um, if you're talking about a human being and you're saying that, you're being blatantly euphemistic, right? They died. Now, let's talk about what happens to their souls after death, right? We can do that, but with elves, it's just, it's different, right? Um, and they're acknowledging that. Um, anyhow, okay. Um, good, DMA is reminding us about how uh, Gildor talked about the Shire being others' lands before the hobbits showed up. Yes, absolutely. So we've already been kind of primed for that. And it's, an, it's interesting, DMA, remembering that conversation and noting from Sam's recitation here, Bilbo remembered this, Right? Frodo's perspective has yet to expand to the place where Bilbo's had, right? Uh, Frodo will still say things to Gildor like, in our own shire, right? Bilbo got this, right? Was our, was the, the, the fact of Bilbo's composing this poem uh, the way that he has, translating this the way that he has, shows he is perfectly well aware of the, the shire's place in the larger world historically, right? Um... Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Um, excellent. Good. Okay, so... And again, and that second stanza... That second stanza... Very Hobbit childlike, right? His sword was long, his lance was keen, his shining helm afar was seen. The countless stars of heaven's field were mirrored in his silver shield. Having a stanza to describe his armaments, that's pretty normal, 
right? Long, much longer than that descriptions of people's armaments, right? Whether you're the errantry dude, um, or, you know, or the, or Arendel whom he grows into, or exactly Tony, lots of Anglo-Saxon people in the past, or, or that, that there's, there are lots of people, you know, this is a, this is a standing thing, right? But this is brief and simplistic and pictorial, right? Um, I'm going to try to give you a sense. I'm going to emphasize the the things that you would notice, right? Uh, and the important things about him. He was a warrior king and went off and died in battle, right? So I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, you know, his sword and his lance. Um, his lance, right? His spear, the great spear, Aglos, which gets kind of little... Uh, you know, it's not really on the marquee here in that stanza, right? Um, his shining helm afar was seen, you know, like inviting us to imagine Gilgalad looking like a star off in the distance, right? Um, and uh, um, the countless stars of heaven's field were mirrored in his silver shield. Um, does that mean that there were stars on his shield? like painted there probably right um uh or does it or again is this just a, a visual impression that like his spiel his shield was so shiny that you could see you know that it would reflect all the stars of heaven um possibly both i think um but um anyway yeah um and then we talked about the long ago he rode away thing uh, so I think this is a really, really fun poem um, and a really, really cool glimpse into the kinds of things that Tolkien does with his poetry, right? This is why it's so important to pay attention, not just to the poems themselves, but to the sound of the poems, right? If you just look at the content, right, it's really easy to look at this and just be like, lore poem, right? Yeah, it is a lore poem, but it's not just any lore poem. In fact, it's quite unlike the other rhymes of lore that we get, like the ring uh, 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 rhyme. Um, one of the trends that we can notice when we look, um, you know, one of the trends I was noticing when we did uh, the Tolkien's poetry class at Signum was most of the most of the rhymes of lore are trochaic. That's a pretty standard thing for the rhymes of lore that we get. Um, this is not a regular rhyme of lore. It is uh, a rhyming poem which is designed to convey lore, but this is a Hobbit poem um, and clearly designed to be a teaching poem. And it's so much fun to see that and to see what Tolkien is doing here. The last point that I'll make and then we'll stop is that last line, the point of contact that this has with that other thing, the very uh, near quotation in that last line of the ring verse, which Bilbo obviously knew, right? Um, for into darkness fell his star in Mordor, where the shadows are. Um, it is amazing to think about... Um, it is amazing to think about Bilbo in the Shire, right? With the ring of power in his pants pocket, composing this poem and quoting the line from the the elvish lore. Um, remember, Bilbo didn't know he had the Ring of Power in his pants pocket at the time, right? But he obviously did know uh, the the ring the 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 ring poem, right? Um, Gandalf introduces it to Frodo as a rhyme long known in elvish lore, right? And Bilbo has presumably come across it at some point. There's no reason to think that Bilbo wouldn't have heard of the Rings of Power uh, and even have have uh, seen or heard the rhymes of lore. He's probably read the ring lore, the ring poem before, right? That doesn't mean he necessarily knows it has anything to do with the ring in his pocket, right? Uh, Gandalf says that he didn't know, right, um, uh, when he gave it to Frodo. And we can see that. We know uh, back from chapter one uh, that that's not what Bilbo was thinking. 
um, even before Gandalf assures Frodo that Bilbo knew no more than he told him, right? And that he would not have wanted to give it to Frodo if he knew that he was putting Frodo into the kind of danger that he was and would have been. Um, But yet he echoes that ring poem here. And again, so I don't think that this, I don't think that we can see this as Bilbo making a a point, right? And I don't think this is the ring acting on him uh, and affecting his poetic composition. Um, That would seem a peculiar thing, I think, for the ring to do. Um, I think it's just a coincidence, essentially, right? Um, Or, you know, I think I think it is it is this is a chance of chance you call it kind of thing that when thinking about the fall of Gilgalad in uh, in Mordor he uh, thinks about the Ring of Power right uh, and the Ring lore that he's had and so when he's describing Mordor he immediately goes to the line from the poem right from from the Ring poem in Mordor where the shadows are. Um, it is an obvious illusion for Bilbo the poet, Matt. That's just exactly how Bilbo would think. Um, uh, and uh, But yet, that connection takes on a much greater significance, and that's, of course, where Sam ends. Right? Sam ends with the part of the poem that describes him, Gilgalad, riding away. Right? Riding away from the Shire, going off towards Mordor, and falling into darkness there, right? Which turns out to have a relevance, not to Bilbo himself, for all that the Ring of Power was in his pocket, right? For Sam, in part, right, the, 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 it's almost like, you know, the destiny of this poem composed by Bilbo, or, uh, uh, you know, rendered by Bilbo, um, was to teach Sam, right? It was, it was in order to instruct Sam, uh, ultimately, that that was, that was the, the achievement of the purpose of this poem. But of course it also does foreshadow Frodo's journey, right? He himself is riding away. Where he dwelleth, none can say. Remember Frodo's talk about going into exile, right? Fleeing from danger into danger, where he dwelleth, none can say. You know, he's going to go there and not come back again, for as, as far as he can tell, right? Um, and uh, his star may yet fall into darkness in Mordor, where the shadows are. Except, as we will see, in Mordor, when they are in Mordor among the shadows, that's where Sam is going to see the star, which does not fall, right? Um, and, of course, they will not, indeed, parallel the fall of Gilgalad in the end. Um, anyway, uh, this is uh, really awesome, right? I'm really glad we got to the poem today. I know you guys were hoping we would get to it next week, and then you were thinking we might not even get to it tonight. Oh, one other thing that I wanted to um, uh, recommend, uh, Steve... Uh, Rinrus has done a, a, a musical setting of this poem, and uh, he uh, he posted that. So if you go to the discussion board, the questions for Narnian section of the of the discussion board, you can see uh, he posted a link uh, to his musical setting. I didn't have time to play it tonight, but um, but I definitely commend it to you there. Um, so okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna end with this. What better place to end than with the poem here? And then we'll pick up on. Uh, the reactions to the poem afterwards and Sam's sort of explanatory words uh, there. So, um, very good. So we're going to... Um, ooh, yeah, Brick Tales, remember to bring that up next time. We totally want to talk about... We want to think about um, uh, uh, this poem and the reaction to this poem in conjunction with the Wanderers in the Shadowed Land uh, poem that uh, Frodo sings in the Old Forest. It's a really great comparison. I want to make sure we come back to that. So, uh, Bricktails, it is your job to remind me to uh, make that connection next time. Um, awesome. Okay, cool. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining me. I'm going to say goodbye to the folks on Twitter. I hope I was right side up today. Uh, that's been my modest goal. Periscope has been playing some odd games uh, <laughs> lately, so sorry about that. Uh, I hope uh, I hope I was able to 
look you straight in the eyes here this evening. Uh, so thanks. We're going to be switching over to twitch.tv slash signumu uh, for the rest of our discussion here. I'm going to hit the, see if I can hit the X here, which I never seem to be able to do with that hand. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if it's a, uh, if I was the inverted Corey last week, apparently I was 90 degree rotated Corey, so I have no idea what's up with Periscope. But okay. Incredible inverted Corey. Yeah, I know, right? Um, okay, so. Good evening. <laughs> good evening. But Lori, thanks. Uh, glad you're back. Yay. I'm glad to be back. Yes. Okay, so um, today. In our field trip, we are going to continue our exploration of the area around um, the area around Weathertop. Uh, of course, we made it nowhere near to the top of Weathertop in the book today, uh, which I didn't really expect that we would. Uh, so we got to the base of Weathertop last time. We found that path coming down from the north. Um, oh yeah. And um, I'm going to. Uh, uh, so instead of continuing and going up Weathertop, we're going to wait until we get to the passage describing the top of Weathertop, and then we'll go up there. So hopefully, hopefully, next time. We'll see. Um, uh -huh. uh, oh, shoot. I forgot to mention class next week. Class next week is happening normally, so I guess it's okay that I didn't mention it. Um, Okay, so uh, we're going to... But we are going to head out to the Lone Lands. Um, so let us... Uh, let us head out. So let's, we're gonna, we don't need to really go to the stable master. We can just mount up and ride there. Um, we're going towards the Forsaken Inn is where we're going to go. All right. So I have a fun little Lord of the Rings story oh, yeah? this week. So my brother showed up at the Tangent Artist meeting with a, with a big grocery bag full of little things in there. And he says, I think you might want this. A friend of mine gave it to me. Okay. It's all of the Burger King kids meal Lord of the Rings figures from the from the movie launch of the Fellowship of the Ring. And I, I kid you not, he had like, I think there's 13 pieces and their bases. Oh my goodness. A complete set. I'm sitting there going, you know how many crappy hamburgers I had to cram into my stomach and all I got was three <laughs> Boromirs and a Celeborn? <laughs> Like, I could not believe how cool his collection was. I am going the wrong way. Here we go. That is awesome. But, so my my daughter, who I'm reading the book with, you know, obviously thought it was really cool, and she was able to pick out who all the characters were. But cool. the two-year-old loved them, and we could not keep her away from the figure. She doesn't like plush toys. She doesn't <laughs> like dollies. She doesn't like Mickey Mouse. But here she is with Lurz the Orc and Arwen playing together on the couch. <laughs> Go figure. Awesome. She was awesome. at it for two hours today doing little voices. Very cool. So, Very so cool. So maybe I have I have two Tolkien nuts in the family, maybe. <laughs> Neat. And, and I mean nuts in the nicest way, of, of course. course. Absolutely. <laughs> of course. They're um, in good company. Yeah. Oh, Tony, yeah, before I forget. So the next week I'm skipping will be the week after. So I will be here next week as normal. That will be, what, the 31st next week? Um I'll be here yeah. then, but the week after that, um, which will be what the seventh, I guess, I will not be mm -hmm. here then. Uh, so we'll be, I'll be gone the week of the seventh. Then I should be back the week after that, and then I will be gone. Um, I'll be gone the week. So I just kind of pausing here outside the south gate to make sure everyone catches up with us that is going with us, just to make sure we didn't lose anybody. Um, okay. Oh, see? A couple more people. All right. There we go. Um, yeah, so I'll be gone the week of the 7th. Then I'll be back. Uh, I should, I think, Baymoot will not interfere with Tuesday nights, so I should be back for most of the rest of August after that. Though, actually, uh, a date that you can kind of put on your calendar. Um, you may. It's been a while since we've done this, uh, but... Mm -hmm. Last year, we used to do some occasional Europe-friendly Exploring the Lord of the Rings section, uh, sessions. And oh, yeah. it's been a really long time since we've done that. And I feel kind of guilty. So we're going to do that again, actually. Uh, we're thinking on August 21st. 
that's a th- Tuesday, isn't it? The 21st? Mm-hmm. I think yeah, that's that, that day on the 21st. So the Tuesday after Baymoot, uh, we're going to do uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. We're, so we're going to do a Europe friendly time uh, then. Mm-hmm. So we'll begin to do an afternoon uh-huh. session. Okay. I'll yeah. see if I can make it. My kids are back in school then, and they get home right around two o'clock. So. Oh, I see. I was I was actually timing that for right before my <laughs> kids start school. They 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 don't start until I think the Monday after. Actually, mine um, start August fifteenth. August fifteenth. That, that is does. cruel. Do they at least yeah, get well, out by they, Memorial Day they, or something? Yeah, they get out in okay. May. All right. Well, so, then where it's cool outside, and I want to be outside. Uh, okay, I guess I guess that makes some sense. And you're down where it's hot, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I so, think it was the rule they instated around here for families who don't have air conditioning. Right, right. No, that that makes a certain amount of sense. Uh, yeah, up here, late August is quite lovely. Actually, it can be <laughs> hot, especially in the first part of August. But my mid-August, it starts to cool off in the evenings again, often, and is really nice. So we we can see a nice uh, a nice outline a nice silhouette of uh of weathertop uh against the stars here from this vantage point which is very nice um really interesting to see how it's on the one hand it's it's not like you know the lonely mountain or mount doom or something you know just like a lone hill standing out in the midst of a uh, you know of a flat plain um but uh you know, it is it is in a line of hills, but it certainly is very prominent among those hills. And it mm-hmm. um, the 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 way that they've done the ruins, we'll talk about this more when we get there. But just thinking about it from the side, we can see the sort of irregular. You know, th- those are obviously ruins that we can see they're jutting out rather than natural outcroppings of rock. So you can already see even from here that they have made the tower much more than just a ring of stones on the top of the hill. Um, and yet yeah. the ruins that they have also do certainly make the top of the hill from a distance look like it's it's wearing a crown. Um, yeah, and, and as, a, it's, as a, a really great vantage point where it is, you know, you can't get much better. Yes. I mean, they kept that part. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but anyway, so... We're going to the middle of the Barrow... Of the, not the Barrow Downs, listen to me. Talking about the Barrow Downs for half the time. Uh, the Lone Lands. Um, <laughs> because we, uh, you know, we, we, as we've been doing, I've been, you know, trying to explore. It is my goal, uh, you know, as we go through, just as we're going through The Lord of the Rings, with extreme care and exploring the entire text, I want to also explore the entire game. I want to see if we can, if possible, go to every part of every region uh, of the game and look at the way that the that they are adapting uh, the not only the world and the landscape, but uh, the stories and the history and the kind of uh, focusing on the sort of world-building elements of uh, the Lord of the Rings Online. Um, so since we are now in the Lone Lands, we're going to, we've been following the path of the fellowship through the Midgewater Marshes. And we found that path finally that uh, comes down from the North towards, uh, Weathertop. And so we ended right under Weathertop last, last time. Um, we're going to go up Weathertop, but we're going to save that for a time when we have actually talked about that passage in the book. So today we're going to do some of the rest of the Lone Lands. I'm just... Noticing where we are, we're at the near the edge of the marshes here. You can see just off to the north here is right those hill slopes. I think if we go around these trees, we'll be able Tent. to see. Yeah, the, yeah. See, there's the ruins where those goblin camps are over there, right? So uh, we're getting right up towards the edge of the lone lands. Um, we've got some wandering goblins around here on the fringes. There's, of course, that broken wagon for which there's a quest um mm-hmm. and uh we've got so now these where the land is less green right at the edge of the Bree lands it ceases to be so green and um we uh we can begin to see the the more rocky and rolling hills and now oh look how much more clearly we can see weather top here and again how crown like the crest of the hill looks with the ruins jutting oh, yeah. up from it. 
Although you make the comparison between this and Mordor, and yeah, I think in my head it's kind of like the difference between the Shenandoahs and the Sierra Nevadas at some point. Right, right. Or maybe that's Misty Mountains. Maybe I'm jumping the gun there. Maybe. I just used to think I knew what mountains were, and then I went to Los Angeles that one time. Right, <laughs> right. I had my mind blown. Right, right, yes, yes. Uh, it's true. I have done... Uh, very little traveling out west and I've still only seen just a tiny little bit of the Rockies Um, I'm trying to introduce myself to the stable master like you do Uh, (laughs) but um, man it's just like everywhere you go there's Weathertop right oh oh yeah and there's Weathertop Um, yep yep yeah throughout these whole and so we can see some ruins up around there I'm looking do we see anything over there yep there's another one over there to the south we can't quite see the top of this hill directly to the south of us. Uh, but yeah, you can see ruins all around. And this, of course, is the Forsaken Inn, which is mentioned in the text. Um, I think it's really interesting that they chose to have the roof caved in, in part of it, right? Um in, in a way, of course, this makes a certain amount of sense. I mean, obviously, they're kind of playing with the name, right? The Forsaken Inn. Um, yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, and certainly from the road, you could be forgiven for thinking that this building was abandoned, in fact. Um, but it also makes sense uh, as a uh, as a sort of location, right? That is to say... Um, we know that this is a functioning inn. It's it's one of the few. I think there are six named inns um, in the books, mm-hmm. and this and this is one of them. Um, yeah, it only gets like a sentence, but there it is. You know. Yeah, exactly. It's it's gonna it, it, it's a sentence we're gonna come to uh, in a week or two. Um, but um, ah, trifle mentions there sh- should be a moot in Colorado. You know, we're. We were working on that. Uh, our plans for Denver Moot seem to be falling through, but uh, still very interested in doing that. Uh, if there's somebody who's going to be around uh, who would uh, uh, who would want to help with a Denver Moot, uh, I would still be interested to do that if we can get that worked out. Um, Altitude Moot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we would call that Mountain Moot. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Let's go into the Forsaken Inn. But, so yeah. anyway, so th- we know this is a functioning inn, as you say. Yeah. Um, Dis- despite having, you know, aerial coverage. Yeah, exactly. Um, we, so we know, we know it's a functioning inn. As we can see here, right, we come inside and immediately we see, no, yeah, we're just kind of open to the sky over here. Yeah. Right? That's fine. Like, we're, we're just living with that. It, it gives you a certain sort of... Uh, uh, there's sort of an acceptance of, well, it's not going to get any better than this out here. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, so, you know, it's, it's rough. You know, it gets, uh, it gets drafty here, clearly. Um, but also, you know, I, I, I don't know, you, you kind of get the sense of like, you know, abandoned parts of the building and this, this inn obviously has seen better days, right? Um, a hive of scum and villainy. It, it is like a hive of scum and villainy. Um, uh, but um, but it beats sleeping outdoors. Yeah. It does, <laughs> and of course, this area, you know, this is the, this is this the the way the place the way that this inn is mentioned in the book. Of course, is that it's like the last civilization, right, uh, on the way out towards Rivendell. So when you go out from Bree towards Rivendell, this is the last outpost. Homely house. <laughs> yeah, this is the this is the last homely house till you get to the last homely house. You know. Um, uh, and yeah, JJ says the last less than homely house. Well, see, it all depends on your point of view, right? If Rivendell is your boundary, <laughs> then, you know, yeah, Rivendell is the very last homely house. This is kind of the penultimate homely house, but it's really semi-homely. Um, Although it's like, it's both meanings of the word homely. Rivendell means it's like home, and this one means it's but ugly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so it, it's... 
but this place is mostly abandoned, not only the inn, but, but, but the land. I mean, we're told that nobody lives here uh, between Bree and Rivendell, that it's mostly abandoned territory. And so, you know, this inn is sort of the last decaying remnants of uh, civilization. And, and, and therefore, I'm also kind of interested in the architecture of the inn as well, Um you notice from the outside, which you can almost see from here, right? Like, can you can you see through the skylight? Um, anyway, it's it looks like it looks like Brie architecture, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah, your plaster and timber. I don't think um, I don't think that this is designed to suggest like this is a remnant of the old days when you know. The people of Bree used to be far more spread out, and 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 but you know now there are fewer of them, and they've kind of contracted into the Bree land. I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, it seems more uh, as if because again, you know, Strider doesn't give any sense that there used to be more people who used to live around here, right? I mean, he said that even the Dunedai never lived out here. That although they came and they established a watchtower there and they defended it. They had like military duty out at Weathertop. Even they never lived out here. Um, so the idea of having it in like this, you know what it, what it makes me think of is what they did in the game with, um, with, with Adso's in right. The guy uh-huh. who wants to build an in between the Shire and Bree. Uh-huh. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's of course not in the books at all, but it's, uh, but it's an interesting uh, sort of, concept in the game you know having this sort of intrepid hobbit who is uh uh wanting to set up shop uh here and of course it is through his actions that were introduced to a lot of the brigandage that is uh brewing right in the breeland wilderness uh and has not yet spilled over into brie as we know it's going to do when they have their real set to um but um but anyway so this idea that, you know, so it, that's what it makes me think of, that like somebody at some point in the past um, uh, came out to here and was like, there's a road here. There's an ancient road here, and sometimes people travel on it. By golly, I'm going to build an inn out here, right? But like it never really took off because not enough people travel on it to support it, and it's really far. You know, it's never going to be the pony, right? Yeah, uh, that's an investment they're not making back. Exactly. And it's 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 not only shabby in the sense of run down, like the giant hole in the roof and even the peeling plaster in the walls and stuff that we can see, but this was never very nice. You know, it doesn't have any of the, uh, well, yeah. You could try their, uh, their, their house drink, which is called Swill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think I'm good. I think I'm good. Yeah. Um, so they need a new marketing guy. That's for sure. Yes, they do. They do. Oh, this is nice. The though. fire here is nice and warm. Too bad the food isn't. The words from a patron here. <laughs> <laughs> is this a wolf's head holding a cloak? That's a nice uh, touch. Yeah, and why can't we have one? That's I the know. next question. Yeah, that's though you would think the boar head would really make a far better because you can hang two coats, you know, on a <laughs> on a boar's head. Uh, oh, four right in this over one. Here. This uh, is well, a four pointer. It's a four pointer. Well, there you go. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. look at that. Yeah, Double or like two two cloaks and two hats or whatever. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, well, a hat in it. One's for your hat. One's for your coat. And- One's for and the other side's for a friend. That's right. No, that's that's perfect. Um, Although but, I don't trust the the walls to hold on to it. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, those they are didn't. almost the only decorations. We do get a couple paintings. There's a weather top painting, of course, uh, here, yeah. and and on the other side we get a what is this a painting or a tapestry? Uh it's oh yeah, tapestry. that's a tapestry. Man, oh yeah, like we've seen that brick. tapestry in a couple places. Uh huh. That, it's like great the, shape, that's though. like the Thomas Kincaid tapestry that everyone it has. Is. It is. That's just what that is. Um, I think we saw that in the Shire somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah probably in Bree. Madden Hall or something. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. I'm not remembering where exactly. I think Down one of the hole. inns. But, yeah, it was, yeah, um, yeah, probably the inns. That's where we see more of the interiors out there. Amali says it's but, in the Great Smiles that I can easily believe. Um, yeah, but this this place is like in the middle of nowhere. It's like the only diner has a hole in the ceiling. This is literally the one diner in my town that every all the old timers go to, and they don't care 
that right. there's a hole in the ceiling. It's been right. there for years. You just cover it with a tarp. Exactly. That's it. That's it. That's clearly, and there aren't that many locals, but those who are come here, um, and few travelers who have literally no other options, right? So, yep. um, and it doesn't have peeling linoleum, but there's straw on the floor to keep the humors away. That's right. It's all good. But yeah, like I said, this doesn't, this, this does not look like, you know, a once fine inn that has fallen on harder times. This does not give you the impression of, you know, like, a signs of an older, greater civilization that has since declined. Um, this is just a shabby out of the way spot, which has always been a shabby out of the way spot. And it's just gotten shabbier yeah. over the years. Um, now, do we think, I'm sorry, go on. Do, no, I think, no, it's okay. do we, do we think some of the, the, the shortcomings in the food and the drink here might have something to do with how uh, the resources of the land like maybe the, the the barley and hops they grow out here just isn't very good, or by the time it gets out here, it's moldy. It, it's something. You know, I wonder. Like they, well, and let's yeah. let's go back outside for a second because, of course, you know, and I already I already commented on this uh, just briefly in passing, but it's worth stopping to kind of notice this a little bit more. Um, it matches yeah, the. It's disc- like- yeah, the, it's it, yeah. <laughs> yeah the 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 border, right? I mean, it's extremely stark. Like if we go over to, like this boulder over here, right? Yeah. Jump up on this boulder. It's a, you know, it's a really. So it's like okay, we look this way, and we're looking at, you know. California lawn and drought season. Yes, exactly. Scrub wilderness, right? Which looks like it gets very little rain. Look at those trees, right? Stunted trees. And which, remember, that's that was from the description in the book, the stunted trees, right? And yeah. then over there, look at the lush and beautiful trees, and like whole forests and rolling green <laughs> pastures, right? Um, <laughs> Tony Meade says Colorado all the time. This looks like Colorado all the time. Yeah, um, and then, and then, oh, you know, we look that way, Valori, right? And there we have the Shenandoah Valley, right? You know, it's yeah, all that's it's, exactly Shenandoah Valley. <laughs> exactly. So it's that green even in winter. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, now, obviously, the boundaries in the game world are much starker than they would be, and of course, we already talked about obviously how the distances are. Are, are completely collapsed. Uh, so, you know, I'm not trying to pretend that this is realistic and that there's this sharp yeah. boundary uh, in the book, and yet it is representing the description that's actually made in in the book, right? That this, you know, part of it is that this land, the Bree land, is tame land. It's cultivated land, right? It's, it's, uh, it's sort of nourished land, and then this is just wild. But it's more than that. The, the description of the stunted trees and everything, there is this sense of, um, uh, well, I don't know, a sense of a lack of growth, a lack... It's certainly not described as, as lush. You're right that you can't imagine crops thriving out here. Or in, even animals. In the Lone Lands. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, And again, that fits with what we see. Uh, in the descriptions in the book. So I think that that's interesting that we have this kind of... It's not a desolation like the description of the desolation of Smaug, right? And certainly, obviously, nothing like the description of the, uh, you know, the lands outside of Mordor, right? The the the, yeah. the blasted lands outside like of Mordor. salt poisoning or sulfur poisoning. Right. No, it's not like that. Um, no. But it is a very different kind of country. Not good farmland at all. <laughs> um and that I think is is part of the um, you know, so one of the things that they are really picking up on here is that is that shift. And to me, it's very interesting because they pick up. I think they in the way they've constructed the Lone Lands in the game world, they have both picked up on a correlation which is drawn seems to me to be drawn directly from the books and also seem to be developing a thread which is not explicitly there in the books, but which seems to kind of fit the spirit of what they're describing. Um, The first thing that I'm talking about is the correlation between the absence of people and the barrenness of the land, right? Um, The primary thing that we know about the Lone Lands is that nobody lives there, right? And then with the description of the 
of the hills and the stunted trees and stuff, we're kind of invited to imagine that uh, people don't live there for a reason, right? That that um, its lack of people is not coincidental, is not sort of um, cosmetic, right? But it's part of, you know, there is something about this land that is inhospitable to living and growing things. Again, not full out, you know, Plains of Gorgoroth kind of inhospitable to, to, to living and growing things, um, but still kind of hostile. Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah, yeah. Again, not not desert, you know, not arid exactly, but 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 yeah, just... Um, uh, it's not impossible to live there, but... <laughs> right, but, but maybe unwise. No, just kidding. You're, you're um, definitely... Po- you're definitely tempting the wrath of some god or other by attempting it. Right. I mean, the way that the impression that uh, that is given, especially in The Hobbit, as they pass through this this area, it's not just a place where nobody happens to live, but a place where no decent person would ever want to live, you know? Um, and there, in The Hobbit, that's primarily emphasized by the description of all of the um, of the ruins and things, like those old castles that you know, those old evil looking castles that look like they were built by wicked people. Um, you know, the only people who ever seem to have lived here seem to be sketchy, right? I mean, there's something about this land, which is really, uh, which is really sort of harsh. So that's one thing that I think that they, the games, the game in their depiction of this land seems to have picked up on, right? The, 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 the presence of the ruins, uh, the correlation with, um, uh, with, with, you know, between apparent abandonment and the the active sort of desolation of the countryside, that seems to be a thing straight from the book, and I really, really like that. I've always liked the Lone Lands. Um, I mean, of course, obviously, it, you know, they were one of the first other places that I saw uh, when I first started playing the game. When I first started playing, I, I, you know, I started Wigand was my first character, and I started him in Bree. Uh, and so, you know, I, I went all the way through the Bree lands, and, and the Lone Lands was the second place I ever went to. And so, you know, after I had gotten... I didn't see the Shire, by the way. The Shire was like the fourth or fifth region that I ever went to, actually. Um <laughs> I, 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 I hadn't been to the Shire much at all. Um, anyway. That does um, surprise me. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyhow, um, but I was really struck by it because, of course, when I first started playing the game, you know, first it's just like, hey, wow, look, I'm in Archit. I'm in Bree. You know, I'm, you know, and just like f- focusing on the, the kind of tourist thing oh, that I talked about earlier. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No. But, um, no, I get that. But then, but of course, in the course of that tourist work, right, I became acclimated to Breland, right? And I'm, uh, I, you know, and I was, you know, Breland became like my normal default frame. So the, the Lone Lands was the first sort of other countryside I came to. And I was immediately struck by how well I thought they captured um, not only the physical description of the land, um, but the, just the sense that you get riding through it, you know, and I could, I could uh, think and feel very much both some of the descriptions we've been reading in the last couple of weeks and also that sense given in the Hobbit of Bilbo's experience of passing through this land. Um, so I, I've always, although, you know, it's not like the Lone Lands are my favorite part or, uh, of the game or anything, but um, I've always really, really appreciated uh, the uh, depiction of the Lone Lands. I think they don't get enough credit when people talk about awesome places in the game, uh, you know, where a lot of really uh, interesting and creative work has been done. The, uh, I've got a soft spot for the Lone Lands. I really yeah, do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The other thing that I would say, so I said there were two factors, uh, the one that they were picking up from the books, and that's this connection between the abandonment of the, of the land by people and the desolation of the descriptions of the land. The thing that they added, that the, the, uh, the Lotro folks just simply added, which is not there at all uh, in the text, and yet seems to me to fit and to work really well, is the um, um, the the active torment of the land that they have put in. And that's, of course, I'm thinking of the Gartha Garwin story um, and how, you know, we come in here and it looks desolate, right? Not just, not just kind of rugged, but like, is there something wrong here? And the Forbidden Inn, or the Forsaken Inn, sorry, it's not forbidden. It's just Forsaken. Um, <laughs> the Forsaken Inn is um, uh, part of that, right? You, you come in and the only habitable structure that you see is you know it looks like it's 
it's practically a it's ruin only itself barely already. habitable exactly yeah. right um and uh anyway so um i uh i really like how as you go through the lone lands and deeper in both in the sake of you know advancing through the local quest lines uh, but also physically traveling further uh and off into the east in the lone lands you come to like where things get sketchier and sketchier and the land becomes actively tormented uh and you come to the fact that there is something deeply wrong here in the lone uh-huh. lands and that you know there is this ancient problem in the lands and that you know with the implication of perhaps that's one of the reasons you know this land has long needed healing um uh-huh. and uh you know has been uh has been enacted so i mean there's a reason why the land looks wicked to bilbo you know as he comes yeah. riding through why he gets such a creepy feeling when he's riding in this area and that's a theme that they keep going throughout the game in different worlds as well, like we saw as Winningmar. Yes. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's um it's you know, it's it's not Ang it's not Mordor, it's not Angmar, you know, it's it's uh it's not even Moria, but it's uh, you know, it's like a a, a, a faint a sort of yeah, sort of like junior league version of that it's it's you know like this this is sort of a a closer to home um not quite as dramatic you know no major evil wizard lives here and yet um it's uh it's it's very striking and there's the ruins of amon sul that we can see right up behind uh the forsaken inn so cool all right well uh it's getting late as it always gets late so (laughs) early uh as we're doing this um is our sort of introduction in some way. And we, we were following the path of the fellowship before we'll see how far we get in the text next time. If we get to the top of Rivendell or to the top of Weathertop, not Rivendell, if we get to the top of <laughs> Weathertop next time, then we will explore the, the hill of Weathertop uh, next week. Uh, if we don't, then I want to carry on exploring uh, down here. There are a bunch of, uh, uh, of ruins and interesting features down here in the Places. western and southern parts of the lone lands that I would really like the to wicked men houses, explore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so I want to, I want to look at some of those things and, uh, very good. So we'll do that. Um, or we'll go up to weather top one or the other. Uh, we'll get around to both of those things sooner or later. Okay. Yeah. Turlani, I'm not suggesting we can get to Rivendell next week. That would be, that would be crazy. Um, yeah, though maybe we should just do, you know, maybe for uh, in the uh, fundraising campaign this year, we should do a, a marathon exploring the Lord of the Rings class where we actually yeah. do like 10 pages of text or something like that. Oh, um, man. That would be really fun. <laughs> like, let's do a whole chapter of the text in one go. As oh, long man. as we have potty and coffee breaks. <laughs> yeah, we would have to. We'd have to. Have, it, would, it would be like an eight to 10 hour class. But that'd be kind of fun. I've never actually done. I've done marathon Lotro streams. I've never done like a marathon teaching session before. I've done Palooza. I've done marathons with like multiple segments in a row, but I've never done one singular thing before. So yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, sorry, I just we totally like thought of that idea. So like maybe like maybe pick the Council of Elrond or something would be a good one. <laughs> yeah, that would be a, that would be a marathon, all right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Given that it takes almost an hour just to read through the council. Oh. <laughs> My daughter is making me take that in chunks and she's like, okay, okay, stop there. That's yeah. all I can handle tonight. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. But I have to go to bed now. I'm so tired, mom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. That's why I, um, um, that's why I, so when, when we did the site visit up in Concord, New Hampshire last week, uh, last Tuesday, I had uh, we we had several of our webinar sessions open for different interviews that were going on at the same time, um, but we had one central webinar session that was running all day long, and that it was based in the boardroom. Um, so I was like, okay, so it's a it's a, a discussion located in the boardroom that goes on all day long. So I I I, I named it I named it Rivendell for that reason, thinking of the Council of Elrond. It's got to be. <laughs> Uh, it's either that or a moot, uh, yeah. like a proper moot. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, okay. Thanks everybody for joining us this week. So we're going to sign off now. I will be back, as I said, next time at the regular time, and then off one week, and then 
back in August. And don't forget, August 21st is going to be our daytime event uh, shifting around. So thanks very much, everybody. I will see you guys next week. Thanks for Laurie. Bye. 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 See you guys next week. Thanks for joining me on this epic exploration of The Lord of the Rings and of Standing Stone's video adaptation of Tolkien's story. If you are having even half the fun I'm having on this journey, I hope you will consider supporting the project by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.